We didn't have an assistant. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. And thank you for joining us for committee interviews being held just before our regular council meeting this evening. We will be interviewing one candidate for a vacancy on the Energy Committee for a term ending September 30th, 2026, and one candidate for a vacancy on the Parks and Recreation Committee for a term ending March 31st, 2025 or 2026. Do we have any public comment for the special meeting before we hold these interviews? There is none online. All right, we are going to start with the Energy Committee with our applicant, Dan Stockwell, who is in person. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for volunteering to be on a committee. Um, we are going to um, ask a couple questions. We're just going to go right down the line, try to keep your answers to a minute or so, and I'll have Councilwoman Schaefer start. Hi, Dan. Thanks for being here. Um, and so if you want to just start and tell us a bit about yourself, what interests you in serving on the Energy Committee and what um, makes you a good fit for this committee? Uh, thank you to the council and everybody here for the opportunity. Um, uh, first, uh, my history, I uh, studied architecture at California Polytechnic State University, Pomona. And um, at that time, the uh, green design green building design was coming to the forefront um, as well as the uh, lead cert uh, certified building um, uh, system that was coming and it was a great time to study i ended up finishing my degree here at humboldt state university what was humboldt state university um, and then but i was able to work uh, at ccat and uh, throughout my entire education i've always been in, very interested in uh, energy and green energy um, basically, you know, cleaning up the world. Um, I then have run two businesses here in the city of Arcata. I've uh, over 30 years been living uh, in the city. And my latest is uh, Tinkerwell Industries. I'm a certified professional inspector. And so I inspect homes and electrical uh, HVAC systems, hundreds of houses. Um, and so I, I feel I have a uh, why I feel like I'm a good fit for this job is that I have a very intimate knowledge of every, the insides of everyone's heaters and electrical boxes. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so how would you describe your ability or past history to work as part of a team, especially in a volunteer position, to come to consensus to develop recommendations to the council and to the rest of the city? Yes, thank you. Um, I also worked at... Um, what was Humboldt State University uh, at the University Center uh, as the technical director uh, for 20 years. And I was on the safety committee there. I was on the um, earthquake retrofit committee there. And um, many times, you know, in meetings, there were, it was it was a, a consensus-based situation. I've also been a project manager. I do design work. Um, I do design drafting for homes and for technology. And uh, I just recently did some uh, installations at the Arcata School District, as well as McKinleyville High School. And when you work with a team of people, you know, there's definitely a consensus. And as a project manager, to get the project to continue to move forward, that consensus um, has to happen. Otherwise, the project is dead. Thank you. Turn on my microphone so you can hear me. Are you familiar with the draft climate action plan? And if so, would you please share your familiarity? Um, I've read the draft climate action plan. Um, what interests me most is the amount of charts that went, went through it. And I was looking at the dates of them, and a lot of them go back to the 90s. And so I'm, uh, to me, it's, it's, I'm, a cu I'm curious because it seems like some of the, the data is going back pre-COVID and you know what is the current data and it, I understand you know these reports take a long time so um, I, I would say that my my familiarity with the the, um, the climate action plan is, is mainly curiosity I want to dive deeper into it Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. What is a current energy related issue you believe the committee should review and discuss and why? I would say the current, okay, so um, going back to being an inspector, I look at um, all these um, electrical boxes and I look at all these HVAC systems and um, right now the energy committee is looking at electrification. Um, there are so many steps to that and I see 
for example, um, an electrical box, you got a meter, right? And so the meter has two, uh, three different kinds of bases. A round base is only a 60 amp service line. A square base is a 100 amp service line. And a rectangle base is a 200 amp service line. And so if you've got these old houses, which many of them, 50s and 60s, they're all round bases, you're not only talking about, oh, let's just you know, put a bunch of electrical systems in a house. Well, you got to look at the whole box. You got to look at the whole meter. You got to look at the service line going to the pole. It's a challenging thing that it's not just the systems in the house, but it's also your whole service line that's coming through. And that's, you know, with PG&E, there's, there's a lot more that's an issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? We have two more. Do you want to use those? Uh, um, well, go ahead if you'd like. I was just going. I'm probably, you know, I'm going. I have a, a place that I was done actually <clears throat> in the '70s, uh -huh. and um, now everyone wants to have electrical, water heaters, stoves, etc. So just listening to what you say, it's going to be a remodel, so the electrical will all be brought up to <clears throat> speed. But it's interesting to think about how the different meters would be and on older projects. Mm -hmm. You're probably concerned about putting a, a stronger or larger meter on an old project that has a lot of gas, and that's one way they've been dealing with it. How, is that a concern, what you think? Yes, <laughs> it, it is a concern. Um, you know, there's also just the simple um, kind of the equity of these older homes. Right, and the people that own these homes, and the cost that that might take a smaller home um, to the newer homes that it's easier to update because they've already got those boxes installed. Um, and also, the service lines are a big issue because if your service line is not large enough, you know you're creating unsafe situations. So it's it's a combination of of, of situations that need solutions, and there are solutions, but it it's you know. It's something that needs to be. Well, you brought up, you know, historic, and one of the things is Arcata has a lot of older homes, and mm -hmm. so this would be an issue for them. And when you were saying homes that were built in the 50s and the 60s, our, that's where our subdivisions, that's when they were built, either mm -hmm. 40s, 50s, or 60s. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So I do have one more question. You know, one of the things that the Energy Committee has been discussing is biomass. Mm -hmm. Do you have any knowledge or opinions or have you have you dealt with biomass? Um, I've studied it. I don't have any personal experience working on biomass projects, but I've studied a lot. Um, the thing that hits me the most, um, especially listening to the last meetings, is the particulate matter. Um, and I was reading up on uh, certain filtrations that basically take the, the particulate and capture it, but then you have to seal it, right? So you're taking carbon and just putting it in a bag, and now what do we do? Do we put it in concrete? Do we put it in something else? Um, and I don't know if any of my, my ideas it can be possible at all and stuff, but you know we have these big companies coming in to the county wind farms, fish farms, all these things, maybe as part of a give take, they could also invest into solar systems because how many kilowatts is that biomass producing? Well, can we get some solar going from these bigger companies coming in and then slowly transfer off into a solar field so we can get those biomass offline so they're not continuing to do the carbon and the particulate that effect. Wonderful, thank you so much. So thank you, Dan. Um, mm -hmm. This concludes our Energy Committee interview. Um, back in open session, we will um, make our decision. So you're welcome to hang around or you can watch. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I was going to ask you, do you have any questions for us? Um, no, it seems though, what is the process then as on the Energy Committee and a decision is made or something? Is it then presented to the council? And then the council decides. I, I was just a little curious about how the recommendations the, yeah. that would be coming, and you have staff, and they would uh, be reviewing those, and depending on what they are. And once a year, um, the committee makes a, a report to the council mm -hmm. about what they've been doing and what they think is should be doing. Okay. Thank you. Your chair does that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you for your time. You so much. 
All right, we will now proceed with our Parks and Recreation Committee. Um, we have our applicant, Joshua um, Lohr, on, I hope I'm saying that right, I'm sorry, on Zoom. Are you there? Yep, right here, can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much, and thank, thank you, you for, for yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna ask you some questions. We're gonna start with Council Member Schaefer, and we'll just go down the line. Hi, Joshua. Um, thank you for being here tonight. And so um, the Parks and Rec Committee advises the City Council and Planning Commission on topics related to recreation, parklands, trails, and public facilities. And so um, just tell us a little bit about your background um, related to recreation and parks and recreation in our community and um, what you know interested you in serving on this committee. Yeah, of course. Uh, first, I just want to th say thank you for having me um, online and accommodating me for that. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I must admit humility. I'm not as professionally experienced as uh, Dan is with the Energy Committee. Um, truly, I'm interested in this because I love being in nature. I love being a part of parks and uh, contributing to recreation in all of its forms. Um, I'm new to Arcata and I'm looking for ways to get involved. I work down at the Arcata Veterans Hall and uh, we I've just really gotten to know the community of Arcata and some of its interesting and wonderful characters. I do have experience with some community development programs related to parks and recreation. Um, in my hometown, Colorado Springs, I ran a, uh, a basketball club and uh, that was called Courts of Colorado Basketball. And, um, and so what we would do is we'd explore courts all over the state and we'd meet people, we'd play basketball, we'd talk with them and we'd connect with them. Um, I also ran a skateboarding club. Um, that one wasn't as expansive, but we did do some training with some younger skateboarders in my area. And uh, it was just a wonderful opportunity. I've, I've viewed parks and recreation as uh, my favorite way to connect with people. And there's a lot of ways to do that, but parks and recreation is just uh, a wonderful, wonderful way to do that. And I think Arcata as a place um, is very well suited to offer that connection uh, in this environment. Thank you so much and welcome to Arcata. We're super happy to have you. So can you please share about an experience that has connected you with Arcata's parks, open space and or recreational activ activities? Yeah, of course. Um, the first one comes to mind is the first experience I did have here. Um, I was a little, uh, I came to college and um, obviously a little nervous, a uh, young kid and not sure all that I was doing. And my first experience, uh, the second day I was here, I had three or four friends um, that came and picked me up in their car. And, uh, and we drove to the Arcata Community Forest and we just went on a wonderful, wonderful hike. Um, there's an open space out there that was really, really nice. And, uh, and that was kind of the realization that I was like, I was very personal um, knowing that I was gonna be all right in Arcata, but at the same time, it was also uh, very communal because I understood that the city and the place that I was in was so fostering to that kind of development and uh, it was just wonderful. So my question is, what do you see as upcoming challenges and opportunities for the city's parks, facilities, and recreational opportunities and offerings? Uh, great, thank you. Um, so I, I, again, I admit humility. I'm not fully re like up to date with everything that the Parks and Rec Committee does. I have seen a lot about the holiday market recently and some of the basketball camps that you guys hold for the youth in the community. Um, in terms of th contributing things in the future, um, I hold a strategic position of being a student at Cal Poly Humboldt. And I think the relationship between Cal Poly Humboldt and the city of Arcata could be utilized very strategically within the Parks and Rec uh, Parks and Rec Committee and Department um, and kind of link those more than they have right now. Um, there are mentorship programs that I think could be offered with college students and some younger kids in the community. And I think that's a relationship that I could um, help guide a little bit just because I'm connected to the Cal Poly Humboldt community as well as the community in Arcata. And I think a committee position could uh, even further that connection. Well, I was just going to ask you, what is your major? What are you? Uh, I'm I'm undeclared, ma'am. Uh, okay, I'm that's okay. I'm just curious. I didn't policy. know if yeah. you were going into the recreation part of it. But thank no, you. No, no, no. Of course. 
Um, I was excited to read about and hear about your experience and passion on the basketball realm. We did a pop-up basketball event out in Valley West, and we do have a large Cal Poly Humboldt uh, student population out there, particularly with the bridge housing at the Comfort Inn, which leads to a collaboration and partnership question about, could you please share an example of a successful collaboration that you have been part of in the realm of parks, recreation, or community building? What made that collaboration successful? Yeah, um, I hate to go back to the Courts of Colorado basketball. I wish I had something else uh, that I could share with you, but that's the that's the first thing that comes to mind. That was one of the most uh, powerful experiences I had. What really made that successful was a very open mind when we were trying to recruit people to be there. Um, I think Parks and Rec is incredible because it's very non-discriminatory, and there are no ways of there are no wrong ways to walk in a forest to play basketball we just want to get as many people there so i think that's the number one guiding principle that i suggest when hosting events with uh with parks and rick i think that's a huge part of it i also think and it, it may sound silly but we got to have it fun it's, it's got to be fun and enjoyable so i always try to put myself in the mindset of like five different age groups um, depending on the event and try to individually understand whether that event would be appealing to those individuals and just kind of identify our target market with those and and I think that's really huge. Thank you and I love your passion about the basketball so please don't apologize. <laughs> Um, and la last question, just kind of follow up on, on something you were touching in um, in your last answer here, but how do you think then Arcata can create more inclusive parks and recreation programs and opportunities for our community? That's a good question. Um, I think it will come in two ways. I think adjusting the mindset that we approach uh, parks and rec, I, again, I'm not sure of the exact mindset of all the people in Parks and Rec community, but I know that we can always be more inclusive and we can always bring more people in. So I think a mindset adjustment will be huge. Um, and then in terms of event, I would love to go out into Arcata. Uh, I'm, I'm a very social guy. I talk too much often, but I would love to go out into Arcata and speak with people on the street, wherever they may be. I, I work at the Arcata Veterans Hall and I can speak to people there, talk about what they need, and, and just identify these specific unique interests that are fascinating to, to these people. And uh, I've got a lot of friends at Cal Poly Humboldt that love, go to Mar that love to go to the marsh and, uh, and to explore down there. And so I think there's a lot of unique opportunities afforded by this unique place. And if we just talk to people and, uh, and keep an open mind throughout it all, I think that would be a wonderful way to uh, bring more people in. Thank you so much, Joshua. Do you have any questions for us? No, ma'am. I really appreciate you guys having me on. Does any other council member have any more questions? All right. Well, thank you again. And we will um, go at new business. We'll vote. Um, and yes, vote for our appointment. So thank you again to all of our applicants. This concludes our special meeting for the committee interviews.
Good evening and thank you for viewing the December 20th meeting of the Arcata City Council. The City Council meeting is being held in a hybrid meeting with both in-person attendance and teleconference access via Zoom. Um, first, we'll do a land acknowledgement. The City of Arcata acknowledges that the land we are located on are unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat people. The land that Arcata rests on is known in the Wiat language as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Past actions by local state and federal governments removed the Wiat and other other indigenous peoples from the land and threaten to destroy their cultural practices. The city of Arcata acknowledges the Wiat community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement seeks to aid in dismantling the legacy narratives of settler, settler colonialism. Um, if you'd like to, please join me for the flag salute. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Mayor Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Stillman. Who do you, oh, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Council Member Schaefer. Here. Council Member White. Here. Uh, Council Member Atkins Salazar is absent, but we do have a quorum. If you wish to make a comment during the meeting, either at the two pub open public comment periods or for individual agenda items, there are three ways to do so. If you are here in person, please line up behind the podium when the item you would like to speak on is accepting public comment. If you are logged into Zoom, click raise your hand when it is time for public comment on the item you wish to speak on. If you're on the phone, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your turn, you will be prompted to dial star six on your phone. For each item, we will be taking person public comment first and then move to online comments. We will not be going back and forth. So if you're wanting to comment, please line up at the podium and raise your electronic hand as soon as public comment is requested for that item. Okay, next we have early oral communication. The city council values your comments. This 15 minute time period allows people to address the councils on, member, on matters that are not on the agenda. Please know that pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take actions on items that are not listed on the posted agenda. At the end of all oral communications, the council may respond to statements. Supported requests that require council action will be set for a future agenda or referred to staff. Speakers are limited to two minutes. There will be also be time at the end for the public to comment specifically on each agenda item. And again, at the end of the meeting under item number 12. Uh, please wake your way to the podium, raise your hand if you're on Zoom, press star nine if you're on the phone, and wish to make public comment. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here and doing your mostly thankless job. Uh, so thanks. Um, I've been here for 37 years. I'm a homeowner in Arcata, and I graduated from HSU, and I've seen a lot of changes and a lot of big changes, especially lately. And people have been coming and talking about the Gateway Project and all that stuff. And I'll leave that. I'm sort of part of that group too, but I'm, I'm gonna leave that to other people. The thing that's come to my attention is, well, there's, there's three things that I don't totally understand. And I'm hoping maybe you guys do, or could provide some clarification. And one of them is the, uh, the term, smart growth technology. So that's listed in, <clears throat> on the uh, City of Arcata's website under the goals. Um, I think goal number 12 is to implement smart growth technology and it has some other terminology. And I'm just, I couldn't find a definition of smart growth technology. And I'm, I'm thinking of it as uh, in the terms of like smart meters and smart appliances and smart everything that's all communicating with its, each other. So I'm wondering if you could clarify that. The second thing is uh, the Edge Connex Data Center. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it used to be the Do It Best Lumber. Okay, and now it's got a big foreboding, you know, menacing looking fence around it. And uh, anyway, there's no description on the city website despite descriptions of all these other major development projects. And I'm wondering if it's gonna be used to crunch surveillance data or what exactly is it? I've asked around town, nobody's knows what it is. And the third thing is license plate reading cameras. I know that we've got them for the last two years around here, and I'm just wondering how many are there and what's the, where's the data going? Is it going to that data center? And 
maybe we could just get some clarity. It seems like we're going into a surveillance state. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thanks. All right, I have a letter. I have. Yeah, and if you would like, yeah, if you could leave your contact information maybe with the city manager so we could follow up. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Joanne McGarry, and um, usually at this time um, since Thanksgiving, I've been standing on the plaza for an hour by candlelight and a vigil for peace in the world. Um, it really um, is an enlightening and informative and meditative and wonderful experience that I'm, I'm experiencing out there and recognizing a lot of things that I can see of, uh, we can do in moving toward the future. But um, like calling it the Arcade of Peace Plaza, um, for one thing, um, very few places in the world have peace in their name and we could be put on the map for peace um, in that way. But I guess what I want to talk is a little more um, about the agenda and such. Uh, last weekend you had, uh, last meeting rather, you had ceremonial, I mean, proclamations talked about and resolutions um, and how proclamations are supposed to be made available throughout the year. So I really want to see a discussion about how that can be promoted and um, uh, made available to the public in a better way than maybe we're doing it now, so that people know what the city of Arcata is proclaiming uh, through their ceremonial matters, which brings me to the concept of reorders of agenda and how that could be made possible for people who are really interested in some of the nitty gritty stuff about um, what's going on at the meeting. So I would like to, for example, we're gonna have a wonderful presentation later on in the meeting from our finance director, and I would really love that to be moved to uh, sooner, because I think a lot of information is given at these staff reports or at these commission reports or committee reports, and so I would like that to be um, considered. I'd also like to revisit how we do ceremonial matters, and I also want to remind you that I'm really interested in a task force on the unhoused and I was able to go to the Presbyterian Church right now where Open Space is doing a dinner, and that was really nice. So uh, more to come. Thank you, John. Good evening. Um, as we come to the end of the year here, I'm, I'm trying to come up with something to give you some wisdom for the new year uh, and a good direction. And you've passed a lot of good things this year, that, but I think that what would make the system a lot better is that we had more clarity as far as some of these large projects that we're doing. Because when you have, get, you have PDFs with hundreds of pages on, and it's very difficult for anybody to keep track of all this. So I um, mean, this is an opportunity not only to make a, a better government situ situation with citizens knowing what's going on, but also it's a, it's a great opportunity for you to get the word out on what you've accomplished. And um, especially with all social media these days, um, you know, most people react to visually. Um, some of the ex examples, the, you know, the wastewater treatment plant, I think it's probably four or five times I brought that up, but um, you know, there's never been really any details exactly how the money was spent. Um, I mean, there should be photographs of what has been accomplished out there, how far along it is. Um, we have the gateway project, um, and you, you know, I don't know how, how many months ago it was that you, you voted for additional money for that. So there was a goal there. Um, I think a lot of people probably are a little fuzzy exactly where that money was supposed to go, but I think it was 3D rendering and things like that. So, um, I mean, this is a, a really a smart thing to do um, for everyone around. And I would also say that in the, in the news, news lately with, uh, Home key has been in the news lately because not of some good good things. This is a twenty million billion dollar initiative the governor had put out there, and there's been you know a lot of fraud and um, some things related to that. So there's a lot of progressive people that are quite upset about not seeing what how this money has been spent, and uh, I think it's a good direction for us to go. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Daggett. Welcome back. We missed you. Good evening, Council. I'm Fred Wise. First, I want to thank you for your year of service in 2023. I look forward to another year of service in 2024. Um, I feel that the uh, Council, while many times I know I disagree and we have our differences, 
I respect your process and your logic and your thinking. Thank you. Um, what I will am going to start a discussion at this time, I'll be writing to you further. It's a what I regard as a fairly serious matter. I'm going to ask that you consult the city attorney and consider how hiring an outside planning and uh, land use consultant, not Plan West. Um, the council has directed the commission, planning commission, to look at moving some of the policies that have been developed in the gateway area to become citywide. Uh, I'm in favor of that. And I think we're all in favor of that. At the December 12th meeting, um, the community director, development director, came up with the idea of an overlay zone. This, uh, he says, quote, and so what staff is recommending in this staff report and the changes that we made, that's past tense, is that we use an overlay zone. Um, there is nothing in the staff report about an overlay zone. The, the word overlay does not appear in the staff report. I feel that this is a major issue. It should be given its own agenda topic and be given as a uh, separate item in a future agenda. Uh, I'll talk more about this. I feel that uh, Dr. Uh, Judith Mayer, Commissioner Mayer, brought this up and was essentially bullied by the chair on this matter uh, at uh, two, minute, two hours, 34 minutes into the video. Thanks very much. We'll talk about this further. Thank you. Do we have any comments on Zoom? We have no online or oral, oral communications. Sorry, no comments. All right. You're so well trained. I know. <laughs> Passing the torch. That. I know. Sometimes I angry punched it though. All right, we're moving on to the consent calendar. All matters on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the city council and are enacted in one motion. There is no separate discussion of any of these items. If discussion is required, that item is removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. At the end of the reading of the consent calendar, council members or members of the public can request that an item be removed for se separate discussion. All right, item A, approve the minutes of the city council meeting of December 6th, 2023. B is bi-weekly report on disbursements. C, adopt ordinance number 1565, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Arcata adding sections 7472.5F and 7492.6 bypass to chapter two sewers of title seven public works of the Arcata Municipal Code waive reading of text and consent to read by title only. D is to adopt resolution number 234-23 a resolution of the City Council of the City of Arcata amending the class and pay resolution compensation and benefits for hourly rated part-time temporary and seasonal personnel to reflect 1-1-24 change in the state minimum wage and update to California paid sick leave and update to city step increase process policy. E is to adopt resolution number 234-22, approving an update to the city's existing policy for installing speed tables, humps, and lumps for residential and local streets. Uh, at number F is to adopt resolution number 234-24, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Arcata declaring the city-owned property at 5540 West End Road surplus land. And G, to ratify employment agreement with Richard Bart Silvers for Chief of Police for the term of December 10th, 2023 to December 9th, 2028. Um, would any council members like to receive an item for the remove an item from the consent calendar? Um, I had a constituent ask for um, number item F to be pulled. All right, we will pull item F. Joanne? Is it an F so I can comment on it, please? All right, excellent. Anybody on Zoom? All right, can we have a motion? So I would move for adoption of the consent calendar minus F. I'll second. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 All right, uh, Council Member White, go ahead. I, as I shared, I um, had a constituent asking for it to be pulled, so I'm just wondering if maybe staff has anything that they might um, enlighten, and maybe uh, Joanne might want to ask her questions first. That might answer both so you have a I just have to understand I'm sorry sure. couldn't quite catch it you have a constituent who's interested in this property 
they were asking if this item could be pulled and um, oh. I did right back and asked them is there anything in particular that they wanted me to ask and they never got back to me so well let's have a staff report you want to give us a staff report um, I can provide a very brief one to um, set the stage and if there are any particular questions then uh, feel free to ask uh, the property in question is a property that the city has uh, owned for um, you know since the 70s and has had a lease with the Gem Mineral Society uh, during that time and uh, at this point we're um, looking for uh, direction to sell the property we actually had prior direction from prior council uh, to sell the property um, but since that time the surplus lands act uh, has been amended such that we have to go through a, a, a public process uh, for disposition that includes surplus land act so that's why this is on the uh, the agenda tonight excellent can really do you have anything else I just want to clarify that uh, the new um, law is that it needs to be available for affordable housing and then it can be sold if there's nobody interested in buying that um, yeah that's a that's a pretty good synopsis all right go ahead John Thanks, my white um, I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing so I know that um, but when you're facing there and then your mic's over there, it's harder to hear you. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, I have been commenting a lot on things about land and properties and um, ideas for the future and designing our city and planning our city and such. And so when um, I see these surplus lands, you know, we have a lot of resources in our community. And, um, you know, sometimes what we have is surplus and what its use can be for for the city is not necessarily really um, substantial and so it makes sense sometimes to um, sell that land off but sometimes I'd like to be us to be a little more creative and think about you know land trades and or um, what type of um, way we want to sell that land and I don't know what the restrictions are uh, freedoms are in terms of selling land that belongs to a municipality to whomever puts in the highest bid or whatever I just think that sometimes we get rid of things that um, or we don't acquire things that could be really useful down the line in the future so the surplus land issue is is just one that just comes to mind just because lately I've been talking about um, ideas for land use in places where the land is not owned by the city but maybe there's an opportunity to look at land swaps and or other things like that and rather than just a plain old sale of something that the city doesn't want and won't use efficiently so i just wanted to kind of comment on that thank you does any other council member have any more i'll make a motion to approve item f Second. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Schaefer and a second by Vice Mayor Stillman. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. I would like to say congratulations to Chief Silvers. I'm very much looking forward to working with you and thank you for your service. Yes, I saw you sneak in and I wanted to say, yeah, thank you for yeah, your yeah, continued you service to Arcata and you looking should, forward maybe, to it. Maybe you should come forward because <laughs> Do you want to say a few there? words? You're absolutely welcome to. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, then He's we'll got just a report we'll later. hold on till then. <laughs> and I was also like to thank the city engineer for letting me know the difference between a lump, a hump, a bump, and a speed table. That was <laughs> very interesting reading. All right. We'll now <laughs> move on to new business. Um, so A is appoint one new member to the Energy Committee for a term expiring September 30th, 2026, and one new member to the Parks and Recreation Community for a term, um, committee for a term expiring March 31st, 2025, or 2026. Um, any questions or comment I'll just say that we had two really wonderful qualified candidates um, for energy committee I mean looking at somebody with that much um, experience as like an inspector and actually getting into houses and seeing what's needed I think that could be really helpful on that committee and super excited to see a, a young stoked I think that's the only word for it uh, Cal Poly student that wants to be on our parks and rec committee um, and so I'll, I'll put a motion on the table uh, to appoint Dan Stockwell to the Energy Committee for a term ending September 30th, 2026, and Joshua Lower for a 
term ending March 31st, 20 or and I would have 26 second that motion. One more pick. So we had a motion by council member Schaefer and a second. Yes. Was that well, a second? I didn't finish my motion before oh, Alec, Alex, because I'm looking at these dates here. And so one is resident only and one is live or work in the planning area. But that one is longer. I don't know. I mean, if there's any strategy for picking that one, but I'm going to say the longer term, March 31st, 2026. I'll second that happily. All right. Wonderful. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any public comment about this? Could I just say something? Absolutely. I just, as always, I'm just always impressed at the caliper of applicants that we have for our committee. And yeah, they did not um, disappoint this time either. So it was really exciting to see both of them. All right, wonderful. Well, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations to our newest members of our Energy and our Parks and Recreation Committee. Thank you so much for serving. And I hope that we can encourage other members of the community to volunteer for committees. Um, it's a really important service, and we really value you. All right. So look at where we are. We're moving on to oral and written communication. Um, the city appreciates public input. This time is provided for people to address the council or submit written comments on matters not on the agenda. Please know that, pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on items that are not listed on the posted agenda. At the end of oral and written communications, the council may respond to statements. Supported requests that require council action will be set by the council for future agenda or referred to staff. Speakers addressing the council may be limited to three minutes with a maximum of five minutes and a time limit on the overall length of oral communications may be imposed. If you are in person and wanting to give public comment, please line up at the podium. Please raise your hand if you're on Zoom or press star nine if you're on the phone line. Uh, speakers are limited to three minutes. Um, but it, it, go ahead. Boy, that was a rapid uh, uh, go through, which also just makes me realize even more so how um, my speaking a second time on public comment and not having heard anything that um, our finance director has said on the or the police off uh, police chief has said you know it would be really nice to have an afterward opportunity um, for for that so um, my name is Joanne McGarry and uh, I wasn't expecting to come up so quickly again but I guess um, I get philosophical, as you well know, and um, I appreciate those who get more detailed and specific about certain aspects of our city. But come 2024, I really would like to see our commitment to putting ourselves out there. Um, Goudini means among the redwoods, and um, we're in a location on the planet that can really exemplify exceptional um, realities of who we are and where we live and what we can offer to the world. And I say that in a broad way for peace, for um, justice, for nonviolence, for compassion. We can really, there's all these international organizations using all those words that I've shared with many of you and in the previous uh, city council. So let's move forward not just with bureaucracy and uh, business as usual. That's not going to save us. It's not going to help us. It's not going to get us to thrive. I want to just remind everybody that we all belong to each other um, in our communities in terms of diversity, inclusion, and equity, but also in our world. It, it, everything is connected. We all, are, we all belong to each other. So that's that. Um, I've been trying to think of a good analogy, so I have a minute left to use this one for you to um, dwell on, hopefully. And um, I'm thinking of signing back up for the community pool and start swimming again. I used to be quite the swimmer or water person, shall I say. I am a Pisces after all. But um, what I did as a child was not hang out in the shallow end or even hang out on the beach towel, um, you know, getting a tan, but I was actually in the deep water. And um, what I think the city of Arcata could really benefit by is getting out of the shallow end and diving deep into what we really, really want our very rich and incredibly beautiful community to blossom and show. You know, so let's go into the deep water and um, and do that for 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne.
Good evening. My name is Dr. Kente Johnson. That's K-I-N-T-A-Y. Last name Johnson. Uh, local president, Eureka N-A-A-C-P. Um, I'm here, one, uh, to speak on behalf of processes. Since you've already made your decision, congratulations on your new chief of police. But the process itself, how that person was picked, I don't think it was very transparent. I read the article. It says that there were 10 applicants. It says that there were community feedback into the person that was picked. Where was the opportunity to provide feedback? We're talking about processes. I would encourage you as the city who, who reaches out to other organizations of color, like my organization, like Happy, you reach out to other organizations of color, other BIPOC organizations in here, it's all performative if you're not then involving those such said organizations in your processes. When it comes to hiring the people who are gonna be governing these cities, who are gonna be policing these streets, our, this is our children too walk these streets, not just y'all's. We need to be involved in these processes. We need to be invited. At least allow us to have feedback. If you're gonna write an article and you're gonna make a forward statement like that saying that there was an opportunity for our community people. And I don't disrespect the Chief Silver. See, the man has years of experience and I'm not saying he's not qualified. And I'm sure, Chief, I'm gonna work with you in a professional level outside of here. This is community member, president of the local chapter of his branch speaking about a process. I sit on the, the PD for my college. So I'll see you on that, on that force board. We see each other, we'll get to work together. But just processes, Karen, processes. And, and I know you know what I'm talking about with this one for sure, because this one kind of stinks. And I'm not going to go there right now. But you know what I'm talking about, and that's why I showed up tonight. This one stinks. Clean it up. Processes. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Chief. Not you. The process. Thank you. I'm Fred Wise. Um, the council has said many times that you watch the meetings, the planning commission meetings. Uh, so I'll assume that you either have or will be watching the meeting of December 12th. Um, to my mind, there's a number of improprieties that occurred. One is that there's a framework that was used in that meeting, uh, similar to what has been used in the past. However, in the past, the commissioners submitted their written comments uh, prior to the meeting and they were included in the packet in writing. This time that was not done, so neither the public nor the commission had the benefit of seeing what they were going to talk about in writing prior to the meeting. That does not correspond to the framework. Um, the, um, the use of negative polling in an area which is of such significant impact as policies for the general plan that will become citywide policy I think is completely incorrect. I know that the council understands how general pol plan policy works because of the uh, Arcata House partnership um, proposal that was turned down because it was outside the city limits and uh, not in tune with the policy of the green belt around the city. Um, as you know, the uh, new draft of the gateway area plan came out. Uh, it came out prior to the meeting, yet it, according to the cover, it proposed to contain material that had already been done in the meeting, which hadn't happened yet. Uh, the community development director said that it was inadvertent, but this has happened before. Um, the, uh, when you do see the meeting, I'll ask you to look at the comments of uh, Commissioner Mayor. I know that you can't take advice directly 
from a commissioner, and I don't ask you that you listen to me. That's why I said that I think that at this time, the council needs to consult an outside urban planner. Um, as uh, Commissioner Mayor said, I don't know that designating the entire area as commercial mixed use really accomplishes what we've been seeking with this plan, uh, rather than leaving it simply as a gateway code that, that would, um, it, and she goes on from there. We've been, for two years, we've been calling this the gateway area plan. Prior to that, in the housing element, it's called the gateway plan. There's 40 mentions of the words area plan in the document and in the cover. Uh, to say that we're gonna change it from an area plan to a correlate plan at this date needs serious consideration, and that's what I'm asking for. Thanks. Thank you. I know you've been missing me, so I've been gone for the, the last month in Miami, so I was there partly for Art Basel, but also because there were some pretty important uh, events with architects coming in and uh, workshops relating to uh, infill projects and basically in Miami there's you know billions of dollars that are pouring into lots of different areas the design district and Wynwood and in Little Haiti um, so it's it's a way of uh, kind of seeing what I saw a year ago and kind of the explosion of mid-rises high-rises and uh, so I'm, I kind of compare it to sort of what's going on here with the gateway. And um, while I was gone, I, I, I heard that uh, Danco received like $150,000 to um, stimulate some, some growth in Sunnybury. So I, I, I guess what I have to say is that, you know, if, if developers want to develop, there's, there's really nothing stopping them from doing it right now here in Arcata. I mean, we have state laws that have changed dra dramatically. Um, so I'm, I'm still kind of confused. And this is like the second year anniversary of the gateway that we haven't brought, you know, developers in to like, you know, specifically ask them a lot of questions. Um, because I mean, I'm almost feeling, which maybe I'm the minority, that the, the gateway is, I have no idea how much money has been spent on it. Um, I mean, that's kind of the, one of the things that I addressed earlier on was, you know, how much money have we spent and where has it gone in different aspects of the project? But um, I almost feel like it's been a complete waste of money from the standpoint of, we have a we have a really pro development council. We have a really pro development planning commission, and if any project came through here, after you heard from the public, it would take you about two minutes to a, approve just about anything, and, and the, for the city to get something going. So there is a problem there with why um, you know we're not getting development done for you know low in low income housing. I mean I, I think Fred spent a lot of time with it was a goal was 20% at one point, and it seems to be dropping because we're concerned that um, if we make it too difficult, um, we may not get anything. So. Uh, I really think uh, this new year we need to bring the developers in and ask why we're not getting development happening here. And because I go to other cities and they don't seem to have to even try very hard to have, you know, developers have the same issues in other cities. They have the same stumbling blocks if you want to look at it at that standpoint. But they, when they see a way of making money, they do it. And uh, we need to look into that. Thank you. Do we have anybody online? I will close um, oral written communications and that'll move us on to council and staff reports. Um, so all reports shall be specifically limited to, uh, limited to city business and shall not request or lead to action by the council at this meeting. And so um, our first order of business is to receive the quarter one fiscal year 23-24 financial report from Tabitha Miller, finance director. Good evening, Mayor. And a new vice mayor, congratulations to both of you and the, and the rest of the council. Um, let's get started here. So first of all, I, I want to put a little bit of context into the reports. Um, and, and I certainly think that we can do highlight some projects and kind of take on some of those tasks going forward. But this is a big picture 
um, view of the city finances, and that is the goal. One of the things, we do have um, an online budget book now that if anybody's interested in digging into the details, um, that is available. And I didn't plan for it tonight, but I'm certainly happy to at some point do a five minute run through um, with the council on how that works if you're interested, and we can certainly do that. But so again, we're looking at the big picture, a few kind of clarifying points about how these quarterly budgets are organized is that they are taken by quarters, so they're worth their three months of activity. This first one is July 1st through September 30th. And if all things were equal, you'd have approximately 25% of your revenues and 25% of your expenditures in the report. Um, I can tell you that that's not really the case, particularly with quarter one, because of some of the timing issues. One of them is that at the year end, we spend much of our time working in both fiscal years. So we will have revenues that come in after the 1st of July that are related to the prior year. We'll book them back into the prior year. Same thing with um, expenditures. It's very often that our expenditure invoices um, come, come to us the next month or even the following month, and there can be a one or two month delay in getting those paid and getting those booked. But we actually accrue those back to the period that they happen. So we always go back into the prior year with those. Um, and what that means is that the information um, in the first first quarter report can be a little sparse in some areas as far as what we're using to um, put together a picture for you. Part of the reason that um, we've included a projected line as the right-hand column in most of those reports is so that we can give you an idea of how we're projecting and what trends are there so you can see what we're anticipating at this time to be where we end the year. And that will be a work in progress and it certainly um, will be updated as the quarterly reports come out. So with that, I'm not going to go through every um, summary, fund summary that was included in the report. I thought what I would do is I would start with the summary for all funds. And again, it gives you a good picture of what's there and it'll also highlight some of the trends um, and some of the patterns that will, will play out in each and every one of the fund reports. So the first thing I wanted to kind of point out is talk a little bit about timing on revenues. Um, you will notice that 1% or approximately $200,000 is all that we have taken in in, in intergovernmental revenues. Um, this particular category, and it is our largest currently in the, in the current budget, um, much of this is our outside grants and outside funding from other government agencies. One of the challenges with our grants as far as timing is that almost all of those um, are paid in arrears, which means that we do the work, we pay for the expenses, we submit re um, reimbursement invoices, and we get paid back. Um, in the first three months of the year, we just have not had much of that come in, and so that's part of the reason there. Um, you will notice on the next one, 22% um, of our charges for service, and this is really more consistent with that 25%. Um, most of our services are paid for as you go, so you would consider that this is usually going to be a real-time charge, um, and that number is pretty consistent with where we'd like to be at this point. Um, oops. Taxes are another area where we have delays, and just for example, our sales and TUT tax, there is only one out of three months that is actually in the books on the Q1 actuals here. So much of what we're doing when you look at our projected number on the right-hand side is we're, I have a little bit of, um, because this meeting is in December, I've gotten a couple months more that I've been able to go back and look at, even though it's not calculated. Um, and we are, the good news is that while this is not um, over the top, we are a little above where we expected to be from a budgetary standpoint, um, so we're pretty consistent with budget. You'll see that we've built in about a $200,000 increase overall in taxes. It's a very small amount, but it's a positive, um, and that's, that's a good sign, especially this early in the fiscal year. I'm not gonna talk about the other revenues there because they're fairly small and minor, but I wanted to move down and just talk about, so your total budget was $73.5 million citywide, and you're looking at um, being about $300,000 above that at this point in time as far as our projections. So again, I feel good about the fact that there's not any bad news here and there's not great news, but we're consistent with where we told you we would be when we started with the budget this year. So on the um, expenditure side, and again, these trends will follow through most of the funds. Um, 
We have spent more in capital outlay than we've brought in in the revenue side, but it's still pretty low at 10%. I will tell you if you added just one of the payments that we made on the wastewater treatment plant that was paid in July and a few that were paid in August, that number would, would bump up by $3.7 million and it would be 18%. So again, a lot of this is timing. The work is being done. It's just not necessarily being booked to this particular period of time. The other interesting thing, and we've, we talked about this when you, when you adopted the budget, um, more than half of your expenditure budget is capital. And if you take that out and you look at just your, your operating budget, which is everything else up there, which is to particularly your labor, materials and service, and then the small amount of interfund and debt service, um, you're at about 22% of your total budget. So you really, again, are right on target. It's consistent with your, your charges for service and your, and your revenues. Um, Personnel services, which is your labor, you're a little below budget. Um, the nice thing is that there is about a $700,000, which is not a huge percentage wise, but it is a good number of savings. Um, I will say that that's not a very large number compared to pre previous years where you've had a much higher salary savings amount, which is a good thing. It means that we're, there are not too many vacancies, there's a few out there, and actually probably the, the largest portion of this, about $350,000, is actually in your police department. And even a portion of that comes from some of the um, hiring bonuses that we budgeted because we were, we were overly um, optimistic in bringing on those lateral hires. So there is a little bit of money that's built in, and you can see that that's in your projected number. Um, just to kind of highlight this a little bit, and this will be true again throughout all of the reports, I'm fairly conservative on my projections. So when I have a, a salary savings or a savings that I identify in one quarter, I don't assume that that's going to carry through all three of the remaining quarters. I recognize it for that quarter and then assume we're going to spend the full budget for the other three. So you'll see those numbers change over time. The next item is materials and service and um, our intergovernment payments. You'll see that this is actually above 25%. One of the big reasons for that is that we have a lot of expenses that start at the beginning of the fiscal year that are for a full year or an annual amount. So it's not un un normal that that number will be high the first quarter or two and then taper off as we get towards the end of the year. Um, this just happens to be the, the total and again, comparing it to where we're ending up. Again, we've got about $200,000 in additional revenue projected, and we've got about $400,000 less in expenditures um, for the year, which again, pretty much right on budget, pretty much right where we wanna be. So I'm gonna move to the general fund, and I know this looks a lot the same. Um, and I don't wanna go through, because we've already talked about, you know, sort of all of the, the delays in taxes, the delays in intergovernmental revenues, um, you know, again, charges for service, operating transfers, there's some things in your, in your revenue classifications um, that are right on target. Same thing with your, per, your expenditures down below, your personnel's on target, your capital outlay is, you know, we've hardly spent anything there. Everything's pretty consistent with the overall funds and the way the city has run. Again, you budgeted for about a $2.9 million um, use of your fund balance. I will say if you look at your estimated beginning available in the black in the middle there, that's a pretty good number, $10 million. That does not include the reserves that you've set aside in your reserve policy. So you've got you know, some, some money in addition to this that's available for the rainy day, you know, sort of those long-term futures. But that's a pretty good fund balance, even with the 2.9 if we spend all of that this year. So again, I feel like the general fund's in pretty good shape. You'll come in a little bit better than that. Um, and the general fund, about $100,000 is what we're estimating here. Okay, so the ARPA funds, this, this fund is a little bit different in that it doesn't have a renewing revenue source. So I just took that line out and wanted to focus on pointing out some of the projects that are, are planned for and are, are currently being worked on using the ARPA funds and then give you an idea of where you're gonna stand. The number at the very bottom there, um, if you spend all of the money that's budgeted this year, you'll have about $207,000 left over. There is, um, and, and you can see on the other side, the $463,000 is, is a pretty conservative 
idea of where we'll end up, and you may even repurpose a few of these funds um, for other expenditures in the following year. But the point again is that this is a, this is one-time money, and we are kind of coming to the end of it. We do have to have it all. Um, committed um, by the end of the next fiscal year and completely spent by December of 2025. So we, we do have some limitations and we certainly want to spend that money and make sure that we use it wisely. Um, just at the top, the Arcata Main Street um, payment, that didn't go out until October, but it, it, is, it has been paid. Um, you've got other support payments. You have a number of items here um, that, that I think that even the 30,000 is probably an optimistic number. That's an area where we don't really have any, we've got some money set aside, but no projects and no identified use. And that may be something that you wanna look at repurposing. Um, the safe parking money um, by now, by this date is essentially spent that has been taken over by the county from an expenditure standpoint. We have not spent any money on MIST. Um, part of that's the county billing. There is an opportunity to potentially spend a little bit more, and that's something the council may want to consider. The ambassador program, um, it's, it's good and it's going, um, but you will have some, some funding I'm sure you won't spend, even though I've put 160000 into your projected. That's pretty optimistic, and you'll probably carry forward some of that money to continue that project or that program next year. Your pavement master plan, I know you're going to spend all of that. Climate change, you've got a number of projects there that if they don't get spent this year, I'm sure they'll carry over into the beginning of next year. Um, we've got the Valley West Community Center. This was put in at original budget of $175,000. Um, part of that was because we weren't sure exactly what we were doing when we did the budget. We now have a better idea, so we um, have lowered our anticipated spending, and that will carry forward and, and cover rent in the next two years. Um, you've got staffing that you're maintaining, and, and that's probably the one that we need to be the most aware of going forward, because that staff that are likely, you're gonna likely wanna keep um, on working in the same capacity, and so we may have to move some of those expenditures back to the general fund. Your South um, I Dock Street project, that will be spent, beautification projects, the Golden, Golden Green Corridor, um, the, many of the art projects are coming out of those those funds there, your radio system for your police department, we've got a flyover planned, and then the CUNA funding um, for that year. But again, just wanted to make sure that we were touched base on where we were at on those. So I'm only gonna hit the wastewater and not the water fund. They are very similar in how they operate. The big difference, of course, is how much capital outlay you have. And if you look at that, it's amazing. And I said this when we budgeted it, 77% of your wastewater fund expenditures is capital, which is huge. And over $18 million, million of that this year is funded by outside sources. So it dominates your budget. It's not how it's gonna look every year, um, but it still is in pretty good shape. And the numbers are right, right on um, with your revenues at 25% and your operating expenditures are just above 20. 25% too. So the only other um, fund I was going to take a specific look in the presentation, and again, if you have any questions about the others, please let me know, is just the stormwater fund. And this is really one that does, I can't say that it's doing great, and it hasn't. <laughs> and if you look at the number there, um, it will. Our, it is budgeted to operate at about a two hundred and forty thousand dollar deficit this year, um, and it only has um, available working capital after that of about one hundred and sixteen thousand dollars. It can't continue to spend more than it brings in. Um, it is, and we've mentioned this. It is um, part of a rate study that's currently going on. So I'm sure this this will come back to you with um, ways to potentially what what the revenue number needs to be to actually operate this and to support the the functions. Um, but it is something that I wanted to point out because it's not necessarily healthy. It's not sustainable. But it is one that is in the works, and it is something that you'll want to keep sort of in the back of your mind as we go through um, this next year and talk about options there. That's it. Thank you so much, Tabitha. We're going to take it back to the council for questions. Um, I'll just start, Kimberly, and we'll go down. So I'm still trying to understand budgets, so this is probably pretty elementary, but um, it looks to me then at the very, we're in good shape. 
and at the very end we're going to have if everything works out a surplus um, looking at like you mentioned other support payments so we budgeted 55,000 will have a surplus or, or the difference would be 25,000 extra that we could reallocate somewhere else is what you're saying yeah and you're and talking about uh, you're referring to the ARPA funds correct yes that's okay. correct so that is true and and again the there will be a there will be money left over at the end, year end and it will be up to the council to decide sort of how to repurpose that but I do know there's some priority projects of continuing potentially the MIST program um, the, com com the community ambassadors, and you'll want to carry some of that forward to make sure you're supporting the Valley West Community Center. Right. So I guess my question is that we will, it'll come before council because it all has to be spent by, what did you say, the end of December? 25. Okay. It right. has to be committed by the end of the next fiscal year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we have time to make those decisions. We do. And we'll make, and you, it will all come back to you when we make, when, when it comes to decisions. In fact, we'll probably take a look again at it in mid year budget. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you for that clarification. So I probably have much the same, but when the ARPA funds, they're just, they're temporary funds. They aren't here forever. And so some of the projects on the ARPA list, are going to be completed and go away, like the dock, I, I Street dock, et cetera. But what about the ongoing ones? Um, we're going to have to figure out how to fund those in the future? We are. And, and it, we actually talked about it at the last meeting. And I know that the council weighed in on potentially looking at, I think the, the focus was on a, an increase in the transient occupancy tax and a potential increase in the TUT to support the, those particular um, items plus potential um, climate mitigation and adaptation. That was one of the other ideas. And in addition to just some of the general increases in cost associated with things like pensions, employees, just unfortunately, like everybody else, you know, we are not keeping up with inflation. But yes, and we'll probably bring that back to you. There's more details coming in the next couple months. You know, because just looking at the list, I can see how many are going to be completed and how many are ongoing and how are we going to handle those ongoing ones. Yeah, and, and there's about $865,000 in budget of ongoing projects that mm -hmm. just, it, it is, as you said, it's temporary, it's one time, this is it. That's right. Okay, thank you. Sarah? Can I just clarify that really quick. So the 865000 that you mentioned, that's an annual to keep each of those projects set? Yeah, it's to keep kind of the four priority, yes. Okay, great. It's an, and it's a total. Okay, thank you. But that means there will be decisions made of which ones we will keep and which ones we won't. Unless we get a whole bunch of money, which is a good problem to have. Well, if we get a whole bunch of money from uh, somewhere. All right, Sarah? Uh, I just have the tiniest little question. Um, could you remind me what what is the percentage that we hold as our like extra reserve in the so, general fund? So it's we actually increased it to thirty percent this last year. And in addition to that, keep in mind that you also set aside um, we we set aside money to pay down the CalPERS, but we also set aside money to put into two and a half million to put into a trust fund that we can use to offset our, our pension cost at any time, which creates another reserve, essentially. Great. Thank you, Tabitha. All right. Thank you so much, um, Tabitha. I really appreciate this Q1 update. Um, some of the comments that I have is that I'm very glad that you're conservative. I know we have some things coming up this year. We have MOU agreements coming down the pipeline again, and so we really have to make sure that we're planning um, for that. Um, one of the things I think I was too tired to talk about at the last meeting was um, exploring the possibility of a vacancy, either a tax or maybe have it be um, maybe just a fine or a penalty, and that's for residential and businesses. Um, so I'd like to explore that. Um, one of the things um, that I would like to see, you know, as we go forward into having these quarterly reports is um, maybe at each one kind of have a special like drill down presentation. So maybe at Q2, not only can we have this presentation, but we can also maybe do a deep dive in the wastewater treatment um, plant or a deep dive into, you know, parks or um, uh, transportation projects that we have and also um, going over some capital project reporting. I think that would be really great to have. Um, but aside from that, I just really, really appreciate your hard work. So thank you so much.
Anybody else? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. And next, um, we have a um, update on the Arcata Police Department from Bart Silver's Chief of Police. All right, thank you. I'd like to start uh, just by saying thank you to the mayor, the council, the city manager for this opportunity. Um, I've been here for quite a while and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the people. I love working with the staff. Uh, we have a great crew in the police department and I'm excited. Uh, lots of good things going on down there and um, it's just a good time. So um, with that, I'd like to get into giving you kind of an update on where we, at, we, where we are at staffing wise. Um, to do that, I'd like to kind of go back a little bit um, we go back to April of this year. We came to you um, with Tabitha, Tabitha's help. Um, we were in a severe staffing crisis. Um, you guys approved the hiring bonus. We really didn't have an idea of what effect that would have. We had never tried that. Um, so since then, we have been able to hire, train, and they are currently on the street five officers. Four of those are uh, laterals. So um, that's been very effective for us from, from our perspective. Um, we were able last Friday to attend a graduation at the police academy for three of our cadets. So they are now with us. Um, so they will now start a training program that's about four months. Um, so we will see the, the fruits of their labor um, about April. Um, and we currently have another uh, cadet going into the January Academy. Um, so that will be uh, not out until July. And then we also have been contacted by three other laterals. Um, that's in the very early stages. Um, don't know if those will develop or not. Um, but the, the hiring bonus certainly seems to be having an effect. And that, uh, is, we really appreciate you taking that seriously and, and putting that into place. Um, now, with all of that said, we did, we did gain the, the, the five additional officers. Uh, we do have three that are on maternity and paternity leave. Um, so they won't be back with us for another couple of months. Um, so there's always those kind of give and, give and takes, if you will. Um, so really, we are looking at uh, probably spring before we really see a, a significant difference for us. Um, so it's exciting, but um, I guess I'm just asking for a little patience as we go. I think you've probably already started to see a few more people on the street. I've gotten some comments about the um, traffic enforcement, uh, more traffic stops. You're probably seeing our folks at uh, the schools in the mornings. Um, so it is already starting to, to help, um, but uh, to see some more significant change for us, it will probably be spring. We'll be able to develop um, our more proactive posture from until then. Um, so that's really it with uh, the, the police officers. Uh, if I'll, I'll run through our other, our other staff. Um, dispatch, we're allocated for six positions. We currently have four. We are in the very final stages of hiring a fifth, um, and interviews are ongoing for the sixth. Um, and so in October of this year, we were able to redeploy a police service officer. That position had been vacant since December of 2022 on, uh, from a retirement. But that position is you know, kind of critical for us because it takes cases that are like vandalisms or theft from a vehicle uh, where we don't really have a, a suspect, um, but it frees up police officers to deal with more urgent crimes or to do more proactive policing. So that was a great addition to get back for us. Um, she's hit the ground running. She also kind of is going to be uh, a backup to learn some of the evidence technician stuff so get some redundancy in our department which is badly needed um, so we are, are glad to have that position back as well um, juvenile diversion uh, has, has remained pretty steady for us we still have two juvenile diversion counselors uh, obviously they work with the schools um, they put on parent project classes uh, they did obtain a uh, grant that allowed us to expand our parent project but also part of that grant 
was to uh, help the region develop parent projects. And I believe, I believe it was Fortuna is the next one. Um, so that's exciting for us to not only expand our program, but help regionally um, other places to be able to do that as well. Um, community ambassadors, uh, they have been a significant change for us downtown. Um, they do many things. Um, they have city cell phones and um, businesses are calling them directly for, for many things, for people sleeping in the, the doorway, for shoppers needing help to the cars. Um, so they've really developed a, a lot of relationships down there and it really has taken a load off of our officers and, and really deal, dealing with stuff that uh, an officer doesn't necessarily need to deal with. And obviously that was the purpose of the program uh, among other things, but um, it is an exciting program. I think um, they, they wanna keep doing more and more and more, um, but it has been a, a significant help to us. So, you know, that's really our, a quick overview of our staffing, a few things that are coming for us in the future or near future. Uh, just as I was walking up here today, they are, uh, down there testing the our radio the radio guys were here um, and it's exciting I mean we were getting a completely new radio system and since I have been here we've had some serious dead spots in this town which could potentially be a, an officer safety issue and just in the one day of testing it's looking very positive um, so it's exciting for us to to be able to just have that assurance for our officers um, and, and everybody that, that carries a radio for us parking for you know the police service officer, all of them. Um, January, we'll be rolling out a wellness program for our, our, <clears throat> excuse me, for our officers. Um, that will be everything from counseling, training sessions for not only our officers, but their spouses. Um, it can be one-on-one -on -one counseling services, um, couples. Uh, so it's exciting for us to be able to, to offer that and just be able to provide them some kind of avenue for the stresses that come with the job naturally. Um, and to be able to just have somewhere to go that is, while peer counseling is very important, it's also very nice to sit and talk to somebody who maybe you don't know from either our agency or another regional agency. So that's an exciting thing that's coming our way. And of course, with uh, me being provided this opportunity comes opportunities within the police department. So we'll be going into a lieutenant promotion and then uh, a sergeant promotion from there. Um, and so it just really creates uh, an exciting environment for the department. They're excited. We have a lot of new officers, which is always exciting. Um, they had an incident today and, and the, the officer who was on his uh, third day, I think, of training, he uh, couldn't stand still. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a super major thing, but he was more excited than, and it really brings that excitement back to everybody that works here. Um, so I just, I really thank you for taking our staffing issue serious and making the move to create um, the signing bonus, which we've never done. I know that, uh, Tabitha, you said there was a lot of money left, but in, for, well, from, <laughs> from our view, it has been successful so far because in my tenure, you know, lateral police officers for us, they did come, but not at a rate that we have seen. So it's been a very successful program for us. Um, so thank you. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, Sarah, you want to start? Um, I don't have any questions. That was a very comprehensive update. So just thank you guys so much um, for all that you do for the community and thank you for the update. I was just thinking about some of the other forces for the lateral transfers that we've gotten and I imagine the majority of them are from Humboldt County. Uh, the four that we currently have are uh, we have gotten interest from actually out of state. Uh, right now, there is a young woman uh, from San Diego that it's called. Um, but like I, w I referred to earlier, it's very early. They're calling, just kind of uh, asking questions. Okay. Well, I was just thinking about the other forces. I'm really glad that we've had the lateral transfers and it's helping us out. But I'm sure it's difficult for some of the other departments sure. to do that. And I think it's really good that we have a technician for uh, evidence and uh, that and that that's stayed strong because um, I understand there was a time that it might change. Yes, and we've had an evidence technician for some time now. Uh, the police service officer is just going to be able to assist them um, so that at a, at a crime scene, it's another pair of hands and, and to develop some of that training to learn those tools as well, skills as well. No, I, th I think that's really good. 
And um, I always remember when there wasn't a bathroom downstairs. <laughs> so how hard it was for uh, anybody working in the front office and how policemen used to have to come in to take over for a dispatcher so that a dispatcher could actually use the restroom. So uh, we were able to finally create something and make an area that worked out really well down there for the dispatchers. I just think about it because I remember how difficult it was um, in the past. So I think uh, things are moving along, except you're in the dungeon. <laughs> and maybe one day you'll be able to come out. <laughs> okay. I appreciate so thank it. you. <laughs> Council Member Ray. Um, first of all, congratulations, Chief. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, I know that it's been a challenge trying to get up fully staffed, and it looks like we're gaining uh, a lot of ground there and will be soon. You mentioned that three were on maternity leave. Is that including one of the missed folks or is that three officers? No, that's uh, officers. Okay. Uh, my question would be, do we know when our maternity leave person for MIST will be coming back so that we'll have two people on the MIST staff? Uh, she, I believe she's back. Okay, great. Yeah. That's good news. Um, and then I know that we were, um, are we still anticipating having two designated officers out in Valley West when you're up and fully staffed? You know, I don't know what the deployment's going to look like until we get there. I think everything is going to be uh, evaluated at that time, uh, but uh, we'll have to see, I, okay. I guess, at that point. And congratulations on the two recent graduation uh, for the two cadet, or three cadets. Thank you. Um, and then to the bathrooms, um, my understanding is that when the Woodsman Hall, I know it's in the midst of getting ADA compliance, um, do you anticipate a date that you might be able to have that satellite out there? And I know that you have to sometimes drive back to, you know, City Hall to use the restroom. So there will be a restroom there for you. And, um, you know, we're just really excited to have that out there in Valley West community. You know why we have officers obviously patrolling up there every yeah, day. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we would in the near future be in a place to, you know, have a, a I guess a true substation where you have it open to the public, uh, because that would require much uh, more staffing for us to have somebody at a front desk. Um, you know, I, I anticipate that being a, a place where we can um, do reports, mm -hmm. use the restroom. Um, interview people up mm -hmm. there uh, and use it as uh, a, a work area. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will, you are correct though, that that will save us a lot of time and be able to keep people up in that area versus always having to come back to do something Yeah, and the presence of, of seeing, you know, your vehicles out there and, and right. stuff. Um, and then um, I'm really excited that we've been able to expand the juvenile diversion program to include the parent project in, for Spanish speaking residents. Yes. So I'm hoping that we can keep that going. And, um, and of course, we're anxiously anticipating expanding the community ambassador program to a Valley West community. And um, I'm really happy to hear that we have that wellness program for you folks. Desperately needed. So yay. And again, congratulations. Thank you. So are you saying, Kimberly, that the ambassador, you know, I've been gone for a bit, is the ambassador program you're suggesting that is going to be out there? Or do you wish I, that? I, it's an anxious anticipation. Uh, the is, goal is that when you have gotten yourself grounded and everything, all the wrinkles are ironed out, that we will look for money and try to expand it out into the Valley okay, West so area. It's a wish. It's a wish. Okay, it I just is. wanted to make sure it wasn't uh, approved. Something happened while you were yes, gone. Yes, it yeah. was approved while I was gone. And I'm like, okay, what else is going on? So thank you. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thank you. I thank you so much. I just want to let you know I've, incur I've encountered some of your new hires in the field and they have been wonderful. I read that, um, Heidi Grossman got some accolades for um, the situation that she was in. So I just, I think that is really wonderful. I hope that we can continue to get these quarterly updates, um, maybe include some crime statistics and traffic statistics too in the next um, report out. Um, I just wanna know um, for this year, what's the biggest challenge that you anticipate and what's your goal for this year, your biggest goal for this year? I think the biggest goal is kind of what we've been talking about. I, I would like to see the fruits of everybody's labor um, to get back up to having um, a full detective bureau, um, whatever 
the proactive uh, group looks like. Like I said, I'm not sure how that's going to roll out. Um, but previously with Chief Ahern and even, even before that, we had a group of officers that were able, sort of a POP team. That wasn't really what we, we would call them. Um, but it, they were able to address community issues for short amount, short amount of times, if that makes sense, to be able to address it, um, take care of it, um, but be free of having to do patrol, be answer you know answer calls for service, um, and in the same time be able to back those people up and provide extra coverage for them if need be. So that is really kind of my goal. I want to, and that's why I'm excited for spring, is to be able to start filling those spots back up because it not only helps us operationally, but it helps us just with morale and with uh, the, uh, the availability of uh, positions to, for people who've been doing patrol for some time to be able to branch out, learn new things, develop new skills. Um, so that's a really exciting time for them. I was just to say, I do remember when we had detectives and, and some of the work that they actually had done and be able to, uh, around drug use, et cetera, and how they were able to deal with some rings and. I guess you'd call them that. And we do still currently uh, have, right now we have a detective sergeant. Uh, the tech detective is uh, one of the officers out on maternity leave, um, but we still do have them, but we are short one, if you will. You know, back in April when, when we were talking about, we had to really pull all of those people out just to, out of their positions, just to do patrol. Um, and so they have been with these hires and, and, and with, um, some other moves internally we've been able to get them back because it's very important for them to stay in those roles and be able to keep those investigations going and not having to be pulled back from them all right well thank you so much i look forward to our next ride along if any of you have not been on a ride along yet i highly encourage it it's really <laughs> great to see so thank you so much thank and you congratulations all right i guess let's move on to council reports um city manager deemer do you have any reports before i move on to uh, uh, no, I guess no reports at this time. I'll, I'll provide updates to what you received in the letter earlier, and, and we'll touch base on uh, some of the process questions that were raised. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Councilmember Wright, you're up. Um, so, yeah, I had the honor to help out at Senator McGuire's 8th Annual uh, Humboldt Holiday Food Drive with Food for People, and it was a huge turnout. So a big shout out to our incredibly generous community. Um, I attended the city's homeless housing working group today. We received updates on the Arcata House uh, Partnership Safe Parking, extreme weather, and all the other great work that Arcata House Partnership is doing at the Annex as well. Um, I'm excited to share that the regionally, uh, regionally Humboldt County is coordinating with the extreme weather and other services for our unhoused community. Uh, Humboldt Transit Authority is offering free bus rides to the in-house so that they can get to the various extreme weather shelters during these weather events. And, um, and lots of things in the works for our most vulnerable population happening in both Arcata and our county um, as a whole. Um, and then Alex shared at the meeting, which was um, wonderful, that the Umqua Bank is matching donations for Arcata House Partnership, but you got to do it by the end of the year. Um, I went to the bank today and it was really quick. It was easy. Um, and it's something that you can tangibly do now. Um, and just to remind you that you can only do that till the end of the year and they will match. Uh, I believe that there's no minimum or maximum on the donation and all of that will go to help Arcata House Partnership. And that's all I got. Yeah, you stole my thunder because I was going to talk about uh, about that and because AJ called me he actually talked to me when I was on vacation about how he wanted to get that out and so I did post it today on Instagram I hope it goes to Facebook and the people consider that they can it can be a dollar and it'll be matched for at a dollar so it'll be two dollars so it can be any kind of uh, money that they want to put forward and they can just go in and um, any of the tellers can deal with it and any of the branches in um, our area. So it's all around and so there's, they're seeing people are making those donations from into the other branches. So it's not just Arcata, which I think is really valuable. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I went to the Board of Supervisors yesterday about tourism 
and I went because I am the chair for the Aviation Committee, and um, I wanted to see what they were going to be talking about, what's going to happen. And they had two proposals, A and B, and they decided not to actually go with either one, but to do some more research. Um, and what happened, and I remember this clearly, um, when the uh, city of Eureka decided not to fund anymore the Visitor and Convention Bureau, it used to be Humboldt County Eureka Visitor and Convention Bureau. So people yesterday had a lot of trouble getting rid of Eureka because it was so inbred into our minds for years um, that they're going to be coming to the cities. The, not, I think the county is going to be asking the cities to please contribute. I do remember when we were asked to contribute before when I was on the council, we contributed not very much money, maybe $4,000 a year. And in order to uh, keep the tourism, well, the one thing I, I mentioned, I, I spoke for a moment, and I said that tourism is our constant. We've gone through lumber, fisheries, I didn't mention cannabis, but cannabis, you know, all the different things we've gone through over time. And they're lived for a certain time, but our tourism is constant. And so I think it's I think it's something we may want to look at in our budget this next year is how we could actually fund the uh, Humble County Visitors Bureau. And um, so I just wanted to bring that forward as a thought process. And I do know that they do contribute a certain percentage of the money they get from the county goes to all the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And there was a lot of discussion about gateway communities. And that means um, coming in on, on 101 North and South, 299, and not really 36, but you be careful using 36 at different times of the year. But I'm thinking uh, they're trying to figure out how they're going to, and Gar, you know, the whole Garberville area about how they're going to deal with it and how, how things are going to have to be thought of in an overall basis. And everybody is going to have to collaborate together because every gateway is totally different from any other gateway. So I, I just wanted to bring that forward. Um, Meredith was there as the chamber executive, and I don't know if she can talk about this, so I'm talking about it. And I think it's uh, we're going to have to really think about it. So that was that. and. Um, I, I was reading that at the last um, Coastal Commission meeting that Mike Wilson, our commissioner from this area, attended. Um, they had a presentation that was about housing issues in all the coastal communities. And he said he would get that video to me, and so I thought I would share it with us and all of us and the Planning Commission and staff so that we have more information about what's going on in all our co coastal cities and, and what's happening with housing and so we can keep working on our housing. So, um, so I've been asked to say that Kuna is having a holiday gift bags to uh, the unhoused in Valley West with warm pants. This was also on Instagram and it was on Facebook. So I'm just repeating it. Uh, rain ponchos, hygiene, hygiene issue items, box chocolates, homemade cookies, etc., etc. And if anyone's interested in um, making donations, um, they can get in touch with CUNA because, and they're dealing with the most uh, vulnerable community members in our region of Arcata. So I think that's it. And um, I just wanted to reiterate, I'm sorry I couldn't really pick up the sister city, but if any of you need assistance on any of your issues, I'd be more than willing to help. And I am really pleased to see that we're making changes down at the Transit Center, that we have boxes down there now where they can put information, the doors are gonna get cleared and we won't have all that paperwork all over them. Because at the last HTA meeting, one of the things was brought up um, from the um, consultant, he mentioned Arcata and he said, and so I happened just to ask, and so what do you think? And he said, the doors, get them cleared of all that stuff. What about the sidewalks? Why can't you power wash around them? You know, he said, anyway. So I'm glad to see we're moving forward on that. And also the transit center is open now. And so the doors are not locked and you can actually go in. And I did go down and I know the vans, he wondered who the heck I was. I said, I wanna go in this room. I wanna see this. And I finally I said, I'm, I'm on the Arcata City Council. <laughs> 
I showed him my driver's license. They'd know I was the real person. And um, I think that down at the transit center that the uh, council has been interested in having a office and that we do have a room down there, a conference room, and that could work for it. And I would, um, I've talked to our city manager about it, and I just want to bring it forward because I, I know there's several of you that are really interested in it. And um, so that's probably all I have to say at the moment. Thank you. Good to have you back, Vice Mayor Stillman. <laughs> Um, I, um, last Saturday, I participated in the packout cleanup at the Arcata Marsh. Um, we picked up about 6,000 pounds of garbage in under an hour. So I just want to once again thank Aaron Ostrom and the packout clean, uh, pack out team. Um, they're just amazing. You know, we went um, to the site the day before to make sure that the active camps knew that we were coming, you know, that we weren't going to disturb them. Um, we handed out trash bags and hygiene kits and socks and, you know, let them know that they could, you know, go ahead and bag up their garbage and we'd come back the next day and pick it up for them. And um, it, it worked out really well. So I'm, I'm really pleased about that. I am really proud to say that I've been appointed um, to the Cal City's um, Policy Committee on Housing, Community, and Economic Development. So I look forward um, to attending those meetings and hopefully making a difference um, this year in that um, with California Cities. Um, it's the city of Arcata. Thank you. Um, the city of Arcata wants to remind everybody about how to have a zero waste holiday. I know we've posted a lot about ideas for that on our Facebook and Instagram pages. And I just wanted to wish everybody a happy solstice and can't wait for it to start getting lighter again. I just wanted to mention we have a couple of new businesses that have. Well, I just thinking that I think it. I'm sorry, but you know, I just noticed that we have a few new businesses. You've been really great. The chamber's been fantastic in all the open houses that we've had. I mean, you know, ribbon cuttings that have happened. But I just noticed we have some young um, people that have opened a couple of businesses, and I think it's really, it's really nice to see that we have that happening in our community. Shopping local has been a joy this year. It is every year, I guess. But um, you have a great video. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I think that was a repost from the, the chamber. They're on it. Um, my only two things, we had an Equity Arcata board meeting today. We are continuing our, our board development and kind of just figuring out how things are going to operate, what kind of subcommittees we're going to have, how we're going to convene around, you know, events that take place in our community and, and what that looks like. There's a lot of learning and growing happening, and they've been some really, I don't know, I, I, I get out of those meetings, and I'm like, I feel like we we did a lot, did a lot, um, and so it's been really great to to work with that group, and especially the the city staff, um, Max and Aubrey, have been dynamite to work with with that group. So they've been great. Um, and then the only other thing, which isn't really an update, but it's a you might be interested, and I'll have an update next time. But um, at our RCEA board meeting, which will take place tomorrow, it's happening a week early um, because of the holiday, but there will be an update. Um, on the new PG&E rate structure that I know we're all looking forward to uh, going into the new year uh, with those rates going up and so what that's going to look like and our CAA will have a, a first look at um, you know what PG&E is planning and what those rate increases are going to look like. So if you are interested in learning about that, um, our meeting is at 3.30 tomorrow. You can attend via Zoom or it's at the Marina room the, at the Warfinger building. It's like the downstairs or the bay room, that's what it's called, um, at the Warfinger building. So 3.30 tomorrow if you're interested in hearing what pg &E has to say. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, with that, I think we're going to go adjourn into closed session. Negotiations on pursuant to government code section 5. And the second item will be conference um, with real property negotiations. Um, pursuant